home of Mr. Rugby, Danny Craven, who celebrated his 80th birthday at the Stellenbosch Town Hall. Many friends and invited guests from around the world attended the dinner to pay tribute to Doc. Amongst the distinguished arrivals were Welsh scrum half Gareth Edwards and the giant all-black forward Colin Meads. Doc's birthday party was also a fundraiser to boost the Craven Trust for underprivileged rugby players. Guest speaker for the evening was another Marty, Dr. Darby de Villiers, a former Springbok captain and scrum half. South Africa has, has many rugby players whose achievements and triumphs on the rugby field and beyond can be traced back to the personality the influence, yes, the invincible hand of Danny Craven. For this, Doc, we salute you. This, then, is the story of the good doctor. Stellenbosch and the house of Obas Markota, South Africa's grandfather of rugby. Following in his footsteps, Dr. Daniel Hartman Craven. When I became 65 and I had to move out and uh, uh, leave my post as, uh, as lecturer, I was professor here and uh, I held the chair and I was head of the Department of Physical Education. And uh, when I left, they said, well, there are many of our houses which you can rent. And one is, and when he, they named me the houses, and one was Mr. Marcotta's old house, I said, that's the one. A.F. Marcotta, known simply as Obas Mark, is a legend at Marty's. As a player, captain, coach, and Springbok selector, he was one of the few men outside Danny Craven's family to influence his career but many of Doc's attributes stem from his early childhood. I was born uh, on the farm, Steeton, uh, when the uh, house girl had to go and f uh, call my father when it was time for me to be born. But before he arrived, I was already in the world, and I think I've been like that ever since. I've, I've never kept people waiting. I, if I wanted to do a thing, I did it. And I battled my way out myself to come into this world. Sport was in the family blood. His father, James, farming in the district of Lindley in the Free State, was a keen sportsman, excelling at soccer and cricket. His mother, Maria, was a school teacher whose strength of character left an indelible impression on the young Danny. And she was in a concentration camp for two of the concentration camps. And uh, I must say that if one, there was an outstanding lesson I learned from them, it was this, that they said there must be no uh, grievances, no animosity. Uh, all is fair in love and war. Uh, what happened in the war is something of the past, and there's no use living in the past, we must look at the future. His early education began on the farm school Chicago. In 1924, he entered high school in Lindley. Here, he struck up a firm friendship with Christian Stimmy. He was a burly little chap, uh, sturdily built. I was thin and small, lightweight. But a friendship sort of immediately sprang up between the two of us, in spite of the fact that I couldn't play rugby, and he was born for rugby. Doc played for the Lindley Town first team at the tender age of 16. But his love for the game of rugby began whilst attending the farm school. One day it so happened that I was in town and uh, I went with my elder brother, who had a profound influence on my life because he'd always been more advanced than we were in everything. And uh, he took me to, to a rugby match. And Ermelo, town of Ermelo, was playing there, they won tour, and they played against Lindley. I didn't know anything about the game. All I can remember is that Lindley won because of the wing tearing down the line 
and going over for a try. And that to me was, made a wonderful impression on me, that game. And uh, it, it somehow it just uh, stirred something in me, roused something in me. So that is my game. Study took second place to rugby, and yet he managed to pass matric in 1928. And there we were fortunate in having some very fine teachers, a real highly qualified gentleman who, who taught us not only English and Afrikaans and maths and whatnot, but also a way of life. You know, we in the countryside, well, in our cultural background, uh, we, grew, we were sort of, if I may put it that way, we were brought up on the four R's, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion. And our code of ethics and general code of behavior was strong, but certainly not dogmatic or burdensome. We had quite a happy youth. And when I came to Selma's after matric, my headmaster was an ex Dagbrek student, Jan Selma's. He came and said, no, you go to Volkhoff Hostel there. I think you'll fit in much better there. I've told Mr. Marquotto about you. And this English master of mine, who had been uh, Mr. Marquotto's chauffeur, when he was here, Mr. Elmos, also in Volkhoff, he, uh, he uh, knew Mr. Marquotto well. He came also to see him. He said, I'm sending, I'm sending a springbok to, to you uh, at Selmos, both of them. In those days, one studied at university to become either a teacher or a minister of the church. Doc chose theology, but rugby had a far greater calling under the watchful eye of Mr. Makota. It so happened that we uh, played our trials for the under-19s in rain, <laughs> the pouring rain. And then uh, the next day, I must have played fairly well to, in their minds because the next day the second team scrum off was, didn't turn up. And they said, where do we get the scrum off? And these fellows from Wolfham said, well, Craven is running uh, on, on the side field there. Uh, he played, he's a scrum off, and they called me in. And then he said uh, to somebody, who's that uh, a fellow behind the scrum there? And they said, Craven. They said to one of the uh, uh, the coaches, I think it was Dr. Chase, but uh, you don't play him for the first team. I want to keep him for the spring with team at 931. At the Springbok trials, Donny Craven was picked for the tour to Great Britain and France, but without having even represented his province. On tour, Donny was just like any other player, representing his country for the first time. I was as nervous as could be. But when I felt the dirt under my feet, it left me. And I was prepared for anything. I nearly died before the first, first international I played against Wales, the Swansea, the St. Helens. I nearly went to the Opina, a manager, to ask him to withdraw my net from the team. But I thought, no, that would be in conformity with the name you have, Craven, which means a coward, and which was something that also worried me throughout my life until a certain age. The tour was an unqualified success, but a fateful incident during the last test against the Scots at Murrayfield caused Donny Craven to change his academic course at Stellenbosch University. When I came back, uh, I was still hoarse from the kick I had received on my vocal cords, and I went to see a doctor and he said, you better change your course. You can never become a parson. And uh, I had to change my course. And I think the pulpit is still pleased that something had happened to Craven. Changing a direction in midstream was not no easy matter. Now, what do I do? And uh, General Smith, it so happened that General Smith uh, gave a, a talk here that still was, and he said to these to us, he said, to you students, I appeal to you to come and help me to solve the native question, as it was called in those days. I said, uh, come and help me to solve the native question. And then I said, well, I've, one of my majors was anthropology. That is the direction I'll take. It was actually after his, his address to the students here that I took 
the MA then in, in uh, anthropology. While Dani was completing his doctorate in anthropology, his rugby career flourished. He was a regular member of both Western Province, Marty's, and a stalwart of the Springboks, especially in the Test Series win against the Touring Wallabies in 1933. He was dynamic, he, was a gr he had great physical strength, and he drew the attention of more than one player, which always made it easier for the rest of the team. He was a match winner in his own right and could dominate a game. In 1937, the Springboks toured Australia and New Zealand. Danny Craven, astonishingly, was picked as fly half for the first test against the Wallabies. Five of the players were selectors, actually, for the team, which isn't a good thing. And uh, we had two fly halves in the first test against uh, Australia, Tony Harris and Van der Favor, who were chosen as fly halves. But the committee thought they weren't up to test match standard and Craven was brought in to play fly-off. I don't think it was a good idea, but uh, that's what they decided, and we just managed to win that first test. The South Africans returned as one of the greatest teams ever to tour abroad. They played 26 matches and won 24, and are still the only Springbok team to win a test series against New Zealand in their own backyard. The following year, a team from the British Isles toured South Africa, and in that side was the English fly half, Jeff Reynolds. My opposite number in, in the test, anyway, was Tony Harris. And I, I, uh, I, was very, I th thought he was jolly lucky because the doc would get his, get his grass out, you know, with his um, <clears throat> dive pass, and gave him every time and space to work in. And I, I must that I had a very good scrum half working with me. It was not, not quite the same as what was going on the other side. It wasn't as good. But um, he, was a, he, he was always thinking of what to, do, what to do. He never had a set piece, as it were. If it was the scrum, it wasn't always just going on the blind side. And if it was going about, it was some, some other feature that would happen that would put the opposition off turn. England lost the first test in Port Elizabeth and the series 3-1. Sadly, it was the last time Doc would pull on the green and gold for South Africa due to the advent of the Second World War. After teaching for two years in Grahamstown, he joined the army as director of physical training. While in Pretoria, he played for Northern Transvaal, the third province after Western and Eastern province to benefit from his talents as a player and a leader. Doc had announced his engagement to Mayra Hayward in 1937, and the following year they were married in the Dutch Reformed Church in Stateleville. They were divorced in 1974. When the war clouds gathered, Doc was in Europe having taken leave to further his education concerning physical training. He attended a number of courses throughout Europe before returning to South Africa just after the outbreak of the Second World War. Doc's pride and joy was the physical training battalion, the PTB. Under his command, more than 4,000 underprivileged boys graduated from the battalion. On Doc's request to Smuts, the battalion was transferred from the military to the Department of Education, which necessitated a move from Pretoria to Kimberley, but not for long. In spite of Yanni Smuts' support for the battalion, Doc's dreams for the PTB were shattered by the nationalists coming to power. General Smuts and Janne Hofmeyer wanted us to go into this direction. They said they're not there anymore. Then I knew uh, that was the end of the story. I called my staff together and I said to them, I have a feeling and a premonition that this is the end of the old PTB. Uh, and we will now have to fend for ourselves. They'll get rid of us one by one. I'm all right. I've got a job. I hope you'll also get, but they're well-qualified people. So we broke up, and I came then to Stelmos, and uh, that's how I came here. But that's how politics killed. The most wonderful thing, to my mind, that ever happened in South Africa for youngsters. So I must always stop myself from becoming bitter. That was the best time of my life. One thing I realized, that when apartheid was introduced, I said, God help us. Things are going to happen in this country which 
but which will all feel sorry, and things which could have stopped without the party. And therefore, I could never, never, ever uh, associate myself with any form of apartheid. I know that uh, uh, one chooses one's own friends. And I know something about evolution. Uh, apartheid threw all that, that overboard. The result is we've got to start de novo now. We've got to start from scratch. All those things were unnecessary. All those laws pertaining to apartheid were unnecessary because evolution would have seen to it all we had to do was to conform to the laws of evolution, which we didn't do. Politically, we, we differed. I was a nationalist, and he was uh, a SOP, if you know what I mean, the old South African party, and uh, afterwards the, the United Party. And I, rema I remained a NAT, and he remained a SOP. But the, the, 1949. A new era of coaching, politics, and asserting his unique style emerged. I am Stellenbosch. And Stellenbosch is in my blood. It was because here the foundation of my whole rugby career was laid in this place. Firstly, because of the teachers I had who have been trained here at Selmos. And they carried something of Selmos without saying it. Just something that uh, stuck to them, which they also took with them into the country. You know when Mr. Makoto, uh, before the turn of the century, he wrote to the chief uh, justice, uh, on the PC wrote, I have decided to devote the rest of my life uh, to rugby football. They blamed him immensely. How could you do it here as an attorney practicing in Wellington and coming back to Selmos for the sake of rugby football? But he had something else in mind. He argued that if the players at Selmos got the right stamp on them, if I can use that expression. If I can stamp them in the right traditions of the game of rugby, wherever they go, they'll carry it with them. And I think that those teachers were the carriers of rugby traditions and rugby codes. And they imbued me with the right approach to the game. And when I came here, I just felt that here is a background which Nothing else uh, could even equal. Doc was appointed assistant manager to the 1951 Springbok team for the tour to the British Isles and France. In the side was Transvaal centre Des Sinclair, a joker, as Doc soon discovered. In certain aspects, I was a little bit frivolous. I was one of the younger members of the side, and to me, everything was a sort of a joke. I, I can recall one night we went out to a, a banquet and uh, Doc was at the main table, I was sitting at, at a nearby table, and I asked Yakos Kiwi to find the, 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 the power switch, and as Doc was about to get up to, speed, uh, to speak, uh, Yakos flipped the, the switch, and I dived around the table and took shoes off. Now, Doc got up and delivered the speech, but when he sat down afterwards, he looked around and didn't know where his shoes were, because he, we had to walk out after that. Doc. But the Springboks took a serious view of life on the field, losing just one of the 26 matches they played. During the 1955 tour of South Africa, Doc's coaching skills came to the fore. The Springbok side, and Doc in particular, left a lasting impression on the young Irish centre, Tony O'Reilly. O'Reilly, 35 years later, organized and paid for a lavish reunion between the two sides at the Mount Nelson Hotel in Cape Town. You can always feel uh, Danny Craven's presence, particularly his disapproval. Danny has a, has a way of lowering his eyelids that could uh, stop a regiment at uh, two miles range. And uh, he had instilled a great sense of discipline into that uh, Springbok team. And I think it came through in the fourth test. 
we should really have won that four test. We were ahead at the half, uh, but that just that, I don't know, that sense of uh, collective pride in, in uh, their South African heritage, they won't be beaten, came through in the second half, and they, they really took us apart. And the strange thing, and people don't believe me, that we didn't train properly, we didn't have a coach, we didn't have tactics. We thought that, you know, a, a coach was a posh bus. And we thought that something like, you know, uh, we used an excessive embrocation, working on the theory, if you weren't fit, for God's sake, smell fit. And, and it was just an excuse. I promise you that, that is absolutely true. And yet we learned so much from the methods of Donny Craven, for instance, because he had this command. And, I, and the one word which I believe is missing in lots of life today, not just sport, discipline, that delicate balance between freedom and accountability. At the young age of 46, Doc was reluctantly elected president of the rugby board and duly represented South Africa on the IRB. The first meeting he attended overseas was in 1957. On the boat to Britain, a lonely and unhappy Craven, to relieve his worries, wrote the first of many books on rugby. Then I met great men, great men, who thought, uh, you know what Bill Ramsey uh, afterwards, a few years afterwards said, he said, I know nothing about the laws of the game, but I know everything about the spirit of the game. And that, to my, my mind, is still the most important part of rugby, its spirit. They tell every newcomer to the international, or they did in those days, every newcomer to the international board, they said, we like you. And well, that's nice to hear. But they took me into a room and they said, Danny, we trust you. Perhaps his greatest supporter, then and now, is French rugby president Albert Ferras. I'm proud to be his friend because, to me, Donny Craven is a monument of rugby. He's certainly done more for our game than anyone else. We've always got on well. We don't speak the same language, but we have only to look at each other and we understand one another. That's what's extraordinary. Donny Craven has such a stature in South Africa because he's done a lot for rugby, for reunification and against apartheid. And that's been important. Whilst Doc was immersed in his commitments to rugby administration and politics, he never neglected his duties as coach to the Martys. I played naturally, and uh, I coached naturally, as the occasion demanded. I mean, every, every training session is different, because I've never believed in pep books. I'm stirring up uh, people and emotions and all that. I've never believed in that. I tried it. It doesn't last. It lasts for five minutes. Emotions don't win the match. It's the brain which wins matches. I don't believe in, in, in praise songs. I, uh, if you praise a player, something sticks. And if he feels at ease. He should never feel at ease. He should always be on his toes. I don't care, Os. I term him as an exciting coach because you never knew from one uh, weekend to the next what was going to be on the agenda. Um, I think so much of rugby today is repetitive and the coaching uh, methods are repetitive. But certainly one thing I remember about Doc, there was always something new and uh, innovative. You know, he was regarded as the great motivator and he suddenly one day said, you know, you can't really motivate anybody. It's impossible. And we sort of all looked at him with, you know, astonished eyes. And he says, what you can really only do is sort of set the circumstances uh, within which people can motivate themselves. And I think he was a master at that. But it's the determination of Doc. Uh, uh, the way he can convince you that you can do it. Uh, that is very important. And I think in that way he managed to build many players even uh, in inspiring them to, uh, uh, to reach out beyond their own ability, which make him such a great coach, such a great man. He's very good with young people, gathering them around them, teaching them not only rugby, but a way of life. I didn't make so much rugby. I only uh, followed in the footsteps of uh, of my old mentor, Mr. Makoda, 
he made Sir Walter Rugby. He really, when he returned, he laid the foundation. And therefore, I look upon Sir Walter Rugby in three eras. The first is the Makota era, dating from the earliest times uh, till uh, the beginning of the 40s. Then I came over and uh, towards the end of the 40s, and that was the Craven era until this year. Uh, what I would like to do is I would just like to make another contribution to uh, the game of rugby football in the first place, to Stellenbosch in the second place, and if I can help anybody, uh, I'll be grateful to do so. Doc's coaching career was relatively untroubled, but administratively he was tested to the limit. In the late 60s, when anti-apartheid lobbyists led by Peter Hain were gaining strength, the future of South African rugby looked bleak. Demonstrators proved a constant source of harassment to the Springbok rugby team during their 1969-70 tour of Britain. Doc's influence, of course, was, uh, was uh, strong in encouraging us to go on and not to go home as many players wanted us to do. So he provided that kind of stability. Uh, necessary in under such uh, circumstances he he was the, you know he encouraged us to be cool and composed and uh, to concentrate on the game rather and that that was important it really hardened my whole attitude towards towards uh, the whole uh, project which they are, were launching I felt it was uncouth and I think it affected our play too on that tour the comparison I had to make when I played at now, that is why to me it's uppermost in my mind. I want those two to get together. I want what I had. I want my players to have. But it can't be. And to this end, Doc was instrumental in moving away from apartheid in rugby. In the late 70s, efforts were made to integrate the association and the federation with the rugby board. The era of non-racial rugby had begun. Let us rather concentrate on how to win, and then we will do justice to this game, to ourselves, and then rugby will be the adventure it can be. I believe, and I said so to him at the time, that I believe that he was using South Africa, at least colored rugby, as an instrument to keep South, South African rugby in international rugby. That was sort of the impression that I had of him when I met him that first time. Rugby should be played by South Africans, irrespective of their race, their color, or their creed. Uh, that has been my stand all these years. Later on, when I learned to know Dr. Craven better, he assisted me in carrying out what I really believed in. The rugby development program was a major undertaking. A team of dedicated people organized coaching clinics, which still continue today. I would say Doc is the lifeblood of the team. Um, it's be, he's become obsessed with bringing people together. And uh, being 80 years old this year, uh, we're all tremendously glad that he's had so much su success with this thing. Uh, you know, it doesn't stop with clinics. The clinics is... Uh, learning the, the basics of the game, but the whole essence behind the clinics is human relations. We're bringing the boys together. We believe that the boys who play together can live together. To coach is to be an educator. Uh, and uh, uh, when we brought in the coloreds and the blacks, I said to them, we've got to be, to be the biggest missionaries as from today, because we, this is a, an educational process which will affect them and us. They will do things we don't like and we'll do things they won't like. Therefore, you just shut up and play the game. We're no longer interested in asking a person what his race is. We ask, can you play rugby? And if you can't, are you willing to learn to play rugby? Now, I think this is what you're driving at. All this, all this is due the inspiration given by this one man that we're talking about, Danny Craven. But it's not been an easy road for Doc. During the mid-70s, Doc had problems in his own backyard. The annual clash between Stellenbosch and Cape Town Universities was cancelled for three years due to Stellenbosch's reluctance to open their facilities. 
Happily, the situation was resolved. During that period of change, Doc remarried in 1975. At this time, his constant efforts to keep South Africa in the international rugby community were slowly being stifled. 1981 marked the last officially sanctioned overseas tour. Added to this, the selection of Errol Tobias in that team caused many problems. When we selected Tobias, people said, yes, he's a, he's a kaffir booty eh, and all that type of rubbish. But the fact of the matter is, Tobias was a rugby player. The pressure that Errol was under, people, people will never know. Because um, um, in New Zealand, uh, he got letters and he got phone calls from his wife, and, and I can tell you this now. Um, and uh, people saying that they would, uh, they would do things to his children back home and everything. So it was in, uh, now an incredible pressure. Plus, internally, in the tour party, we had pressure from the very conservative uh, people internally and the uh, administrators who were very, very, very conservative. And Errol was playing with players also. They didn't want him to, to be playing the touring side. I've, I've uh, been very angry, disappointed, because I really felt we, we could have done much, so, so much better on that tour. Um, like you all know, I never had a chance to play centre. Rob was played once out of position, and then suddenly he was dropped. And they, we felt they came, to, came at us. Nobody can tell me that he didn't deserve his colours. And he's a fine man. He really is a fine man, he's, he's, and uh, again, the way he played, so he lived. I think that Doc Craven, unfortunately, his hands were tied. Uh, that um, there was such a, a mm -hmm. strong um, Brillabont uh, situation in, 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 in the Sacramento Rugby Board that Doc Craven had his hands tied as far as selections was concerned, uh, as far as management and coaches were concerned, and Doc, unfortunately, couldn't, couldn't help anything. After the tour, South Africa was totally isolated from international rugby. Local competitions were all that spectators could enjoy. Although South Africa was still a member of the IRB, it was cold comfort, and an alternative to an official tour was sought. A rebel rugby tour seemed the only answer. I'm against the rebel tours. When the Cavaliers came, it was an unauthorized tour. I will never subscribe to pay for play. Never. It will come here. It will come. But not without my concurrence. Well, I have to say, I'm an amateur and I want to die an amateur. Then, in 1986, a rebel touring team from New Zealand, known as the Cavaliers, arrived in South Africa. Thousands of rugby enthusiasts were delighted. If I had to turn the clock back, I would do it again. And uh, I think if we had a turn the clock back, Doc Kramer would do it again. Because here he said, now South Africa proved to the world right here, the last test, that they could be the All Blacks, because they were the All Blacks. We restored our pride again in World Rugby. Brander hield them over Richten. Herstel die fout by a mooi en Karel doet plezier. Het voor Koolie Schmidt als hij bij elkaar. En Schmidt die hart loopt en hij moet opkrijgen. If it wasn't for that tour, I don't know what would have happened to South African rugby. That tour saved us. And uh, we, that's one. All, I will always be grateful to uh, Dalton's team, which came out under all those difficult circumstances. But at Doc's level, rugby is all about politics, commercialism and professionalism. Camps are often formed and sides are taken, as happened recently when two members of the executive were outvoted and one walked. Hitler was a mad man, but you can even learn from mad people. He had one very famous saying, he said, every now and then you have to have a putsch, a purge, a clean-up, and uh, which he applied. And I believe that even in the rugby board, a clean-up was necessary. And that cleanup came automatically. I still respect him, and I think everybody respects him. Um, I wish I could help him more, but you must remember that I wasn't voted out of the executive; I walked out of it. 
And uh, then again, I walked because we all decided to walk. But three stuck to the guns and three didn't. The fact of the matter is that I spoke to Dr. Afterwards and even today, he's the most friendliest man I can even imagine to talk to. Doc's many fine attributes include his moral strength. Through the years, his children from his first marriage grew up with Doc's unshakable values. There are two things that I think uh, that he really tried to teach us, and that is a sense of integrity. That's the one thing I think that I learned from my father. Uh, the other is a sense of loyalty. I mean, I know of no person that has got such a sense of loyalty towards the university, towards South Africa. He has a great love for animals, and my brother James brought back, um, well, it wasn't an Alsatian, some other mixture, and it was supposed to be my brother's dog, and my brother called this dog Blixum, <laughs> and in the end, it was my father's dog, it wasn't James's dog. Maybe not perhaps because it wasn't fond of James, because James perhaps wasn't at home that much, but in the end, it was just my father's dog. I'm sure you've heard of Blixum, and my, Blixum used to follow my dad all around the place. Doc's love for his animals, his rugby and Stellenbosch has been as unwavering as the goals he subconsciously set for himself all those many years ago. Goals motivated by love, not money. You know, when you look at the rugby player, you want to see if he's a good rugby player. You look to see if he has got reserves. If there are reserves which must be taken out to make him a better player, then you as a coach must take out the reserves. And I feel but I still have a bit of reserve. Uh, I think people who are enamored with themselves, who give ego, the ego, in them a place that is not warranted, they must be unhappy. My ego is in this place. If they tell me today, look here, Craven, resign, I go out without any ill feeling and uh, because I'm not doing what I'm doing for myself. That has never come into the picture. I do it for the sake of a cause. There is still much for Doc to do. The Craven Trust, boosted handsomely from the evening's festivities and auctions, is an ongoing responsibility. Doc still diligently serves the rugby community who love and respect him, both here and abroad. Ever since I was a small boy in Wales, Danny Craven has always been synonymous with South African rugby. You know, in South Africa, everybody talks about him as Mr. Rugby, but I think the only tribute I can actually give him tonight is by saying that he's Mr. World Rugby. He wants more and he can't get it fast enough. He's a hard taskmaster and uh, he normally gets things done. Firstly, he's, he's an honest man, direct. And you know where you stand with him. The genius of the man, that's the one thing that I admire the most. He's a, he's a genius. If I had to pinpoint one strength that Doc has, and that is his ability to change. I don't think I've ever known anybody as sincere as Doc Craven. But you felt that he had a command. And more than that, he commanded what I believe is the most important thing for young people. He commanded the respect. And what Donny said, it mightn't have been right all the time. It went. There's a lovely line of William Butler Yeats, the poet, and I would sum him up in the company of South African players who are here tonight. Yeats uh, wrote a couplet which went, Think where a man's glory most begins and ends, and say, my glory was, I had such friends. Danny Craven's a friend. On his 80th birthday, Doc can reflect with pride on his enormous contribution to rugby. And what better place to savor those years than amongst his friends here in his beloved Stellenbosch. Oh, 
Он все Питер тут курит. Все остальные. А был в одной Судан-2 на его месте. Окей.